So an open letter to open-minded progressives, chapter four, Dr. John's Hypothesis by Mencia's Moldbug, May 8th, 2008. Okay. Um, yep. All right, cool. Let's just play this. An Open Letter to Open-Minded Progressives by Mencius Moldbug. Chapter 4, Dr. Johnson's Hypothesis. Published May 8, 2008. In the first three chapters, dear open-minded progressive, we've tried to build up some tools that will help you evaluate the disturbing proposition we're about to present. The proposition is neither new nor mysterious. We'll call it Dr. Johnson's Hypothesis. From this quip by the great doctor, and I have always said, the first wig was the devil. Of course, this is not a hypothesis in the scientific sense of the word. We cannot prove it, nor will we try. It is just a phrase you can agree with or not. The great advantage of Dr. Johnson's formulation is that it has a pleasant Boolean quality. You can agree or disagree. It is pretty hard to be indifferent. Let's take it for granted that, as a progressive, you disagree, and we'll try to figure out what might change your mind. One progressive who famously agreed with Dr. Johnson. I don't even know, like, what the wigs are. Um, I think... <laughs> I think that's all right. <laughs> his hypothesis know. is Saul Alinsky. As Alinsky puts it in his book, Rules for Radicals, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history. And who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins? or which is which, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. What does it mean that the first wig was the devil? What do you think? Wait, what? Oh, right here. Wait, what the heck? The, um, is, is the audiobook not accurate? Is the... The audiobook's words did not line up. Wigs were a left-leaning for the time political party in the UK from the 1700s. Okay. So, it didn't line up here. Weird. Think of when you think of the devil. I always think of Mick Jagger in his song, Sympathy for the Devil. Surely we can agree that the devil rode a tank, held a general's rank, when the Blitzkrieg oh, right raged here. and the bodies stank. What Dr. Johnson is proposing is that the adversary clapped at the Putney debates, that he smeared his face and shook his tomahawk on the Dartmouth, that he leered and cackled as he swore the tennis court oath. Not that it's a short song, but I don't recall these bits. Of course, there is a part about St. Petersburg when it was a time for a change. I actually have been holding out on you guys here. I have a little family secret to reveal. I am not a progressive. My father's parents were. Great neck Jews of the Yiddish variety. Progressive is the exact words they always use to describe their views, and they meant exactly the same thing by it that Barack Obama does. One of the last things my grandmother said to me before she fell down the stairs and smashed her frontal lobe, kids, when your elderly relatives sign living wills, they generally mean it. Make sure the doctors are reminded, often, was that Frank Rich is a really, really wonderful writer. Only you know what? For Gramps and Grandma, who were about the nicest people you could imagine, who certainly had no interest in the devil, or any of his works, not even Mick Jagger, progressive was a code word, a sort of dog whistle. What they really were was communist. I Dude, okay. <laughs> I mean I mean we'll see what we'll see what he has to say, but I'm pretty sure um, I was talking to SFO, right? Um SFO for those of you guys who don't know who he is, uh, it's Short Fat Otaku. Um, and I was talking to him, right? And I said that, you know, if we were to keep on going up until the point, uh, where eventually we would progress into communism, um, and then we were able to make communism work, uh, and then it would work for everybody. And then everybody would be happy. I would say, okay. I would be okay with communism, right? Because we have maximized happiness in the world. Uh, sure, everybody's in Coomer pods or something, right? But I don't see anything wrong with Coomer pods um, as long as everybody is happy, right? Um, 
because for you, there seems to be some kind of fundamental importance when there comes to when, when it comes to like spiritual struggle, right? Um, which is weird. I, I think that I think that maybe you can think that there's something important about spiritual struggle, but some people cannot comprehend that, right? Like some people don't know what to think of that. Um, which is what I guess people who lean to the right have to explain to people on the left, right? Like, if you want to bring people to your side, if you want to explain to them, you can't just explain it using feelings, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's feelings, right? Like, you're talking about a spiritual struggle. It's feelings. Um, Kubo says, hey, we are going to argue, right? We're talking about the far right right now. Okay, after this, after I, after I go through this theory page, um, then we'll argue, then we'll argue, all right? But yeah, I, I just, um, I, I said that, I said that right now I'm a social democrat, right? Because I actually identify as a social democrat. Uh, but if we were to conceive of like a communist, you know, utopia one day, uh, like why would I have an issue with that, right? And he's like, so you are a communist, right? And I'm like, no, I'm not a communist because I haven't seen it work, right? But like, if if it eventually becomes a day where it does work, then why the fuck not, right? Like, like assuming that one day it will work, where this super duper like AI um, were to show that, oh my God, like it makes communism work, right? It's better than the free market. Um, it's command economy by like a AI that is able to simulate the free market, but way more faster and way more accurately than, all right, fine. It's able to control for, you know, monopolies and, um, you know, simulate market models and uh prevent famines and stuff like that then why not right I don't just mean pinkos or fellow travelers of the algier i mean ad live variety i mean actual dues paying members of the cp usa from the 30s through at least the 70s did they have cards did they carry them did they ever pull out their party cards by mistake at safeway i'm sorry ma'am this may entitle you to free travel on the Moscow subway, but it does not provide access to our low price specials. I'm afraid these details are lost to history. But my brother has wartime letters from my grandfather in which he closes by asking his wife to keep faith with the party. My parents recall dinner table conversations from the early 70s in which the phrase party line was used in a non-ironic context. And the story goes that the two of them actually met at a party meeting, at which Gramps stood on a chair in someone's kitchen and made some kind of rabble-rousing speech. I am relying on family hearsay here, because my grandmother would never admit any of it, even to me. Not that I outed myself as a Jacobite, but it must have been clear that I hadn't been reading quite enough Frank Rich. Once I screwed up my courage and asked her if the story about owing my existence to a party cell was true, Oh no, she said. It was a meeting of the American League for Peace and Democracy. I'm afraid Grandma's conspiratorial reflexes were not made for a world with Wikipedia. So, in 2008 terms, what we're saying when we say that the first wig was the devil is that this idea of progress might be kind of, well, creepy and weird. As you see, my family background predisposes me to this suspicion. There is no use in trying to convince me that there was never any such thing as an international communist conspiracy. As a modern progressive, of course, you are not a communist, but like Sartre, an anti-anti-communist. You think of communism as a mistake, which of course is exactly what it was. The anti-communism of Joe McCarthy or Robert Welch still shocks and appalls you. Its opposite does not. McCarthyist is a live insult in your mind. So is fascist. Communist, or any of its variants, is kind of dated and almost funny. You communist. At most, you might say that Obama is a communist the same way. I wonder if he goes into like the complexities of communism because it's like, uh, like if 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 we were to humanize, um, you know, fascists, and if we were to humanize. Um, you know, people on the far right, right? Then I would hope, I would hope that, uh, you know, uh, Card uh, Curtis, Curtis Yarvin here, um, you know, the writer of uh, this, you know, 
you know, this uh, philosophical writings, right? Um, would also like humanize the communists and etc. Yeah, when does he actually criticize communism? He actually doesn't criticize communism, the theory. He, I, I, I think he's, it's more like he's criticizing the W force. The W force being like the natural progression of uh, the, the natural indoctrination aspect. Like he thinks that there's a indoctrination, this generational indoctrination that's going on where the first wig is the devil, where the first wig is the person in which it branches out over time. And then there's this kind of familial like indoctrination, right? Uh, however, that sort of goes for right-leaning stuff as well, right? Like, you are born into a Christian family, so you will also turn out to be Christian, right? But I, I don't know if that's as strong, because a lot of people are born into Christian families, um, but then they turn out to be left-leaning in the end. So it's, I don't know. This article is not really about communism. It's about drawing the line of thought from older left-leaning parties to modern progressives. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know. Uh, yeah, like, like that's the vibe I'm getting. That's the vibe I'm getting, yeah. I admit Romney is a Mormon. Romney is not a Mormon because he personally read the Book of Mormon and felt the awe and mystery of Joseph Smith's golden plates. He is a Mormon because his parents were Mormons, just as Obama's were communists. I use the small c to mean sympathy, not memory. Remember, Yarvin takes a while to get to a point. He still hasn't gotten there yet. <laughs> Don't worry, okay? He Sometimes he dedicates an entire paragraph to, like, a single point in a single sentence, okay? He, using very flowery language, all right? I'm not, I don't, I don't blame him for it. Um, yeah, I, I don't blame him for it. This is, like, all, all writing that is like this. All theory of writing is like this. Yeah, this is normal. Even if you made Romney absolute king of the universe, I suspect that reestablishing the state of Deseret would not be high on his agenda. I'm sure the same goes for Obama and the Politburo. The anti-anti-communist theory of history has a special niche for communism. It is not good, exactly, but it is also not good to attack it, so we won't. The truth is that communism is only one small part of the progressive experience. The conclusion that progressivism must be bad because Stalin called himself progressive is just as facile and fallacious as the conclusion that reaction must be bad because Hitler, though he did not use the word, was a reactionary. This is based. At Sorry. best, communism is, based. is an example of how progress could be creepy and weird. But because of these historical associations, it's not an effective example of creepy and weird. Here's a better one. Scientology. Did you watch the Tom Cruise Scientology video? I really think this is a necessity. If you go straight from this to the Obama We Are The Ones video, not, I hasten to point out, an official campaign production, what is your gut response? Coincidence or um, conspiracy? What I am suggesting is that progressivism from Dr. Johnson's wigs, and even well before, to Will I Am, is a little like Scientology. Let me emphasize the word little. I would say progressivism resembles Scientology in the same way Scarlett Johansson resembles the Kanor Habditis nematode, a Porsche Cayenne resembles a wheelbarrow, or LSD resembles green tea. On the surface, they are totally different things. The similarities are all low level. Scientology is obviously creepy and weird. To make the case that progressivism is creepy and weird, we have one overwhelming challenge the fact that progressives are not, in general, creepy and weird. Progressives are, in general, pleasant, well-educated, and well-grounded. This cannot be said of Scientologists. True. Then again, there is another thing that Scientologists don't have. Friends in high places. At least as far as I'm aware. I would like to think that penetration of Scientology into government and other prestigious institutions is fairly minor. Perhaps I am mistaken about this. I hope not. Because I really have no reason to think that if Scientologists take control of any institution, the CIA, Cirque du Soleil, the New York Times, Starbucks, the NBA, Yale, Apple, you name it, they will ever depart of their own free will. At least if you believe Mr. Cruz, they seem quite sincere about their desire to take over the world. For its own good, of course. Again, does this ring a bell? Maybe. 
but there's only so much we can learn from this kind of innuendo. I'm afraid it's time for some heavy political theory. Our concern is the relationship, past and present, between progressivism and American institutions. Clearly a tricky question. There is no plausible null answer as for Scientology. There is something going on. But what is it? What is the big picture? Let us play a fun little game. We'll separate civilized societies into three types. One, two, and three, according to their relationship between opinion and authority. To make the game fun, I'll describe the classes abstractly, without giving examples. Then, we will try to figure out which class we live in. Type 3 is what Karl Popper called the open society. In a Type 3 society, thoughts compete on the basis of their resemblance to reality. Institutions which propagate thoughts compete on the basis of the quality of the thoughts they propagate. I wonder if he's going to start talking about the cathedral again. Wait, has he talked about the cathedral yet? Wait, did he talk about the cathedral in the first chapter? Wait, he I don't think he talked about the cathedral at all yet. Wait, but I know about the concept of cathedral. Wait, no, he is about to talk about the cathedral. Okay, never mind. Is this rocket science? This is It is not. Uh, the cathedral is basically the most important, like uh, probably the most important uh theory or concept that Yarvin has like talked about, I guess, before, but not. Good ideas outcompete bad ideas in a type 3 society, because most of us would rather be clueful than deluded. While many individuals have cognitive biases, such as a natural preference for optimistic over pessimistic predictions or the reverse, these average out and are dwarfed by the general ambition of intellectuals to see reality as it actually is. Intellectuals are brutally competitive by nature and delight in exploding the delusions of others. Ah, Nonsense should not last long around them. Thus, in a type 3 society, we cannot say that everyone will agree and that they will all be right, but we can be quite confident that the best thoughts will be readily available to those who care to think them. In a type 3 society, there will always be superstitions, because there will always be superstitious people who may, like everybody else, think and speak as they please. There will always be differences of opinion because many questions cannot be answered by precise and objective methods. Whose performance is better, Humphrey Bogart's in Casablanca or Rutger Howard's in Split Second? But since reality is one thing and people are people, people who are smart and want to understand reality will generally cluster around the truth. So when you live in a type 3 society, while... My, my take? Is that we actually do live in the bazaar okay <laughs> i i hope my hope is that people will cluster eventually around the truth um generally people will trip up um end up in places where there are lies and be misled but eventually over time on average people will cluster around the truth um yeah that's my hope all right that's my hope uh, this is my, uh, this is what I believe to be true. All right. Um, that's about it. I feel like I'm listening to Brittany Simon rating scale. I don't, again, I don't really like this kind of like generalization. I think it's complicated. I, I think it's complicated. Um, and, uh, when you're clustering it, like, I guess to something like this, it begins to become easy to for it to fit a particular narrative. I don't mind you framing it in your mind if you're like an autistic person um, who can only frame things in a particular way. Um, so then you can understand it better for your own usages. But then now you're, I guess, now you're sort of like uh, drawing it for yourself. Um, so then... Uh, Mm. Uh, you're drawing it for yourself for other people, I guess, right? To debunk the idea that the truth wins out, he has a great free article on his substack. Power trumps the marketplace of ideas is a TLDR. Um, on average, I don't... You, I, I don't know about that one. 
I, I, like, is there is there a historical example that I guess he appeals to? Like, here's the thing: is that I, I feel like it can't be fringe, right? Um, like for example, um, like like when has when has genocide denial ever won over? I guess ever, right? It's I I feel like the. I feel like it's unfalsifiable because whatever is not known will never be known. And then whatever is known will always be known throughout history, right? We will always know whatever will always be known to us, but then we will never know what will never be known in history, right? Like, for example, if there's any secret wars that have been fought, we will never know that they existed. But if there's anything that have been known to us or have been revealed, then we will know that they existed. So it will always be tautological. It will always be true. And things that are false will always be false. So it's like, it's a conundrum. It's a paradox, right? Uh... Okay, well, you yeah, can think, think for yourself. You generally do not have to think for yourself. Why buy a cow when milk is so cheap? The type 3 society makes an accurate perception of reality easily available to anyone who wants it. If you want an accurate understanding of history, just buy a history book. If you want a weird, creepy understanding of history, you can probably find that as well. But first you will need to find a group of historians who share your weird, creepy biases. The sane ones will almost certainly be in the majority. I think you and I can agree that a type 3 society is where we want to live. The question is, do we live in one? Let's take a rain check on this baby. Type 1 is basically the opposite of type 3. Let's call it the loyal society. In a type 1 society, your thoughts are coordinated by the government. Public opinion is a matter of state security. Why is public opinion a matter of state security? Uh-huh. Basically, China, where my uh, parents are from. Yeah. Because people are freaking dangerous. Anyone who has ever raised a male child has seen its instinctive affection for weapons. Heck, chimpanzees are freaking dangerous. And you will notice that most of the Earth's surface is controlled. Okay, a, lo uh, a little bit of gender uh, uh, essentialism there, but that's okay. We forgive you. Rolled by their uh -huh. hairless relatives, which is clearly not how it would be if our brother apes had their druthers. In a type 1 society, the state establishes two categories of thoughts, good thoughts and bad thoughts. It penalizes people for expressing bad thoughts or rewards them for expressing good. Or uh... Um... But it's true is he said instinctive affection for weapons specifically weapons not for more violence or aggression but specifically weapons right ideally of course both a bad thought is any thought that if a significant number of people were to think it might be threatening to the safety of the state a good thought is any thought that is useful to the state even if just because it fits in the yeah, spot where okay, a bad one really might guys, otherwise go. Actually. To install its good thoughts in your brain, the state supports a set of official information organs, institutions which churn out good thinking on a cradle-to-grave basis. The organs install good thoughts in the young and maintain them in the adult. Hominids are learning machines. They learn what's put in front of them. It's really not that hard. To keep bad thoughts from spreading, the state uses its power to discourage, prohibit, or... Okay, wait. If you if you say okay, if you say that um, boys have a tendency to be more aggressive and therefore they're going to use the weapons more as like a secondary thing, then sure. But otherwise, it just sounds like they have some kind of weapons gene, right? Like like that just makes it sound like they have some kind of weapons gene. But if you say that they have an instinctive need to use weapons as a derivative from the instinctive aggression, then sure, I buy that. But like, that just makes it sound like they have some kind of weapons gene, you know? Destroy unofficial or otherwise uncoordinated information organs. It constructs a... So I criticize the rhetoric. ...legal environment in which Minor direct person-to-person -person -person transmission of bad thoughts is socially and professionally imprudent at best and actionable at worst. It may exempt dissenters from the protection of the law or impose legal disabilities on them or on those who tolerate them. Or, of course, it can imprison, banish, or execute them. In a successful Type 1 society, there have been many, the range of good thoughts may be rich and broad. Many, if not all of them, can be quite sensible. It should be possible for an intelligent member of the governing class 
to live a normal and successful life without having once been tempted to venture off the reservation. However, from the perspective of the security forces, it may be quite useful to have one or two questions for which the bad answer is true and the good one is nonsense. Some people are just natural-born troublemakers. Others are naturally loyal. Separating the sheep from the goats gives the authorities a great way to focus on the latter. Of course, not everyone in a Type 1 society needs to be a believer. The more the better, however, especially among the governing classes. An ideal structure is one in which believers are consecrated <sighs> among the most fashionable and successful social circles, and dissenters, if there are any, tend to be poorly educated, less intelligent, and nowhere near as wealthy. If this can be achieved, the believers will feel a natural and healthy contempt for the dissenters, who will be inclined to abandon any bad thoughts they may have been brought up with if they have any desire to succeed in life. The sine qua non of a type 1 society is central coordination of information. Because the organs are the instruments which make state security a reality, they cannot be allowed to contradict each other. In a state which is secured purely by military force, can various units of the army and navy get into little catfights with each other? No. Likewise, in a state secured by thought control, as well as probably some military force, any intellectual conflict is a menace of the first order. Even on trivial details, disagreement means instability. In other words, the information organs of a Type 1 society are synoptic. They see the world through one eye, one set of doctrines, one official story. They call it the synopsis. How does a Type 1 state maintain the coherence of its synopsis? One easy way is to have a single leader who exercises unified executive supervision. Ideally, the same leader manages both physical and intellectual security. If the Type 1 state doesn't have a single leader, it should at least have a single authoritative institution. Since security depends on synoptic coherence, any divergence can quite literally lead to civil war. There is no mystery around the historical identity of Type 1 societies. This is an unambiguously right-wing pattern. It is also the default structure of human government, the God King. The Greeks called it Oriental Despotism. In Christian history, it is known as Caesaropapism. In Anglo-American history, it is the throne and altar state, as represented by the High Church Anglican or Catholic tradition. When Americans express an affection for separation of church and state, they are expressing an antipathy to the Type 1 design. And, of course, in the 20th century history, we see the Type 1 state most clearly in National Socialism and Italian Fascism. The fascisms discarded most of the trappings of Christian theism, but reused the basic Cesaro-Papist design. Under Hitler's supervision, of course, Goebbels was more or less the Pope of Nazi Germany. His executive authority over all intellectual content in the Third Reich, from films to schools to universities, was easily the equal of any medieval pontiffs. I highly recommend watching The Goebbels Experiment. The Nazi term Gleichschaltung, generally translated as coordination, is more or less the modern epitome of Type 1 design. The Nazi also uses the word Aufklärung, meaning enlightenment, or literally clearing up. Hey, Arceo, welcome to chat. Ye. Um. Yes, please like the stream. Also, if you have not subscribed, please subscribe. Ye. For the inculcation of useful thoughts in the German people. I think of this term every time I see... What chapter are you on? Uh, I'm on chapter four right now, uh, SFO. Um, Dr. Johnson's hypothesis. Um, and right now, uh, it seems like, uh, I, I think I know exactly where he's going. He's, he's going, he's type one societies are, uh, neo-monarchies. Uh, he's, he's described, he's leading up to neo-monarchies for a type one, uh, society. And, uh, type two society is basically, um, you know, the cathedral, right? Um, and type three society is the bazaar. That's basically uh, what he is building up to. But, hey, you know, we call that foreshadowing, okay? We call that foreshadowing. I know what he's building up to, okay? I know exactly what he's building up to, all right? How convinced are you? I am, I, I think, you know, he's 
I know that he's building up the arguments. He's making the descriptive um, uh, claims, right? And and I agree with a lot of descriptive claims. And I have no doubt that you can make a workable, you can make a workable neo-monarchy. You can make a workable neo-monarchy, but it's just that it just really, really comes down to sometimes you just have situations where, damn. Like, like for example, I think um, the last time, the last time uh, I read about Chapter Three, uh, uh, Ake had brought up this specific situation with uh, sex cyborg or or uh, cyber sex cyborg. Um, this one Chinese e celebrity who is a lesbian. And um, China is pretty close to being a neo-monarchy in real life. Um, and because LGBT stuff is not allowed, it's like generally more suppressed in China and stuff like that, right? Um, her life, when she is trying her best to express free speech, and, and stuff like that. Um, when she is trying to express what she thinks, um, and she is suppressed, right? She is suppressed by the government. And by all standards, the neo-monarchy is working as intended. It is a neo-monarchy measure to suppress her free speech. It is a neo-monarchy measure to use anti-rebellion measures, right? Anti-free speech, anti-egalitarianism is an inherent part of neo-monarchism. However, right, because because obviously not everybody is going to have equal rights, it's fine, right? But the thing is, is that despite it being a working society, that doesn't mean that you're going to have non-human suffering, right? You're still going to have human suffering in the society. I want there to be I want there to be less human suffering. So if I want to reduce human suffering, if I want to reduce the amount of bad there is in a country, if I want to maximize the amount of good there is in a country, um, you know, maximize the good, reduce the bad, then I don't want a neo-monarchy. I want I, I want long-term stability. Um, and, you know, one can argue that a neo-monarchy, because of how much they suppress free speech, because rebellion is impossible, then because then you'll have a neo-monarchy because it will be stable. They'll, a rebellion will not be possible, right? But the thing is, is that regardless or not, it just so happens that you'll still have human suffering depending on what kind of neo-monarch you have, right? Depending on what kind of douchebag you have at the front of the government, you'll always have human suffering. So in my opinion, it's better if you have self-determination by the people, so then the people get to decide what kind of suffering they so choose. It's better to have, in my opinion, some kind of human suffering as decided by the mob rather than human suffering as decided by one person because when it's one person it's black or white but when it's decided by the mob it's shades of gray so for me i would rather choose the shades of gray rather than black or white right because now when it is one person it's a coin flip um that is uh you're talking about naomi Wu. i am talking about naomi Wu. Yeah. Maybe you get that some thought. Do you want long-term stability of something awful? That so 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 this is what neo-monarchism is, right? Is that it is long-term stability. It is because rebellion is impossible. It's impossible. It's the whole point is that is that well, okay, ignore the smart guns part, okay? That's the smart guns thing is a meme, okay? That that shit's a meme, all right? Is is that it's it's close to the 
the um the rule right before um Xi Jinping, right? Where um it's you you have no outward expression of physical violence by the state. Instead, all violence expressed by the state that is used to suppress free speech is done silently, efficiently, quickly, and behind scenes. So then when there is no media to portray the violence outright, there is no outrage by the mob. There is no uprisings. There is no protests. There is no whatever. So when everything is done behind the scenes in terms of re-education camps, um, there is no way to really advertise that kind of outrage, right? You can deny, you can um, attack, you can whatever, you can darvo your way out, right? So that is how a neo-monarchy will manage to suppress the, the, the expression of the press, right? Anything that is done behind closed doors or behind the scenes is very hard to disseminate to the public. Um, when it comes to, you know, trying to, uh, you know, spread dissent among the people in a large enough manner. That is hard to do, right? Um, so you want there to be some kind of optical violence, right? This is why, like, in 1989, Tiananmen Square, for that one, th that is why that one is a huge mistake by the Chinese government to actually do something crazy, Right? They did an outward expression of violence that caused a lot of outrage because it was something that actually physically happened. So when something like that physically happens, it is very risky, right? So now after that, they learn from that experience and now they're going to do everything behind closed doors, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so yeah, it's like that's basically, um, <clears throat> that's basically just how I sort of Understand how to suppress some shit, you know? Anyway. A big argument against democracy is that some mobs can generate a go good uh, mobs to generate blind out and not in line with justice, see lynchings. My argument for democracy is that I think people should have self-determination. It's better for people to have self-determination towards their own suffering rather than have a ruler at the top be pompous enough to make the determination for the rest of people for a better decision, if that makes sense. That would be my position right now. But who knows? Maybe, you know, I would put the chance at a low chance of Curtis Yarvin changing my mind, but I'm still open to my mind being changed. I'm still open to my mind being changed, but this is my honest thoughts right now. That's my honest thoughts right now, because right now, even before, like, whatever the heck, um, the way I sort of see it is that I already have a philosophy in place. I already thought things out, you know? It's not that I never had a philosophy in place before reading all this stuff or consuming all this stuff. Um, I know what I believe in. I know what is right. I know my definitions of good and bad, right? Like, like I already know all these things beforehand. I already thought these kinds of things out. I don't need Yarvin to tell me this. So... So yeah, but I am open to, you know, um, having doubts. I am open to having my mind changed, right? Be a public service message. We also see the type one pattern, if not quite as distinctly in the communist states. It tends to be more institutional and less personal. It is easy to identify communist Hitlers, but there is no clear communist equivalent of Goebbels. Communist states over time experienced a decay of personal authority, which passed instead to the institutions. But the party in a modern, one-party state is more or less equivalent to the church in the old Christian dispensation. And an established church is an established church, whether governed by pope or synod. The type 1 state is clearly the most common form in history. It is not the end of the world. China today is a type 1 society. It also has the world's most successful economy, and it is not such a bad place to live at all. Elizabethan England, which experienced perhaps the greatest artistic explosion in human history. Well, hold on. I, that really depends. That really depends on who you're asking, right? Ask a Uyghur Muslim. All right. Also, Roman King, holy crap, was I can't stop watching that crap with Alex and Destiny. I was getting so pissed off. Um, yeah, that one's uh, it's rough. It's rough. Was a type one society with secret police galore. 
On the other hand, North Korea is a type 1 society, and it's awful in almost every possible way. I can generally say that I would rather live in a type 3 society than in a type 1 society, but the details matter. But here's the problem. The problem is, modern, post-1945 Western society certainly does not match the description of a type 1 society. For example, there is no coordinating authority. Unless you can come up with some conspiracy theory, it simply doesn't exist. There is no Goebbels who tells writers what to write, filmmakers what to film, journalists what to print, or professors what to profess. There is no pope, there is no church, there is no party, there is nothing. And as we've seen, the Type 1 design makes no sense without coordination. On the other hand, however, one, while our society does not match the Type 1 description in this essential sense, it seems to match it quite well in others. And two, while it matches the Type 3 description in some ways, it does not seem to match it in others. In a Type 3 society, for example, we should see intellectual inhomogeneities between competing institutions. Harvard and Yale should mostly agree, because reality is one thing. So should the New York Times and the Washington Post. But there will always be sclerosis, stagnation, drift. Competition, not just among ideas, but among institutions, is essential to the Popperian ideal. We should see these institutions drift away from reality, and we should see the marketplace of ideas punish them when they do, and reward those which do not. Do you see this? Because I sure don't. What I see is a synopsis. From my perspective... Here's the thing, is that I actually do see the marketplace of ideas. Uh, you can find specific examples where the marketplace of ideas uh in fact do not win out right for example misinformation is a huge problem when it comes to platforms um on reddit uh people only read the headlines um when it uh on Twitter, people only read the headlines. Uh, people have now gotten ADHD brain, uh, where people only read the headlines and that's all they read, and then they share it with their friends. Uh, and another example is like, for example, um, <clears throat> TikToks, right? TikToks is another great example of like the failure of the marketplace of ideas, where um, now, if you put it in a really short form content, people are more inclined to believe it just because you're scrolling through. You're not really thinking as much and you're not bothering to check every single like TikTok on whether it's true or not. You're just going to take it as a word and then you're going to tell your friend, hey, by the way, this is what I found on TikTok. And sometimes you're not even going to say the word. Yeah, the, uh, you're not even going to say the sentence. Yes, this is what I found on TikTok, right? You're just going to straight up say, yeah, guess what? That footage that I found of, you know, the Israeli IDF, you know, shooting upon these, you know, whatever the heck was totally real. And like they were blasting away, right? So the thing is, is that, yeah, the marketplace of ideas is not going to win um, in like all the battles that it fights in, right? However, I would actually argue that it will win generally on average over time. For example, why is it that Project Veritas a uh, total meme far right news or quote unquote news organization who only lies for the propaganda of the far right um, is not like as verified or as credible, considered credible as CNN or MSNBC, right? It's because it has been proving fa proven false time and time again. It's just because the truth will win out in the very end. Um, CNN, Fox News, uh, MSNBC, New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, uh, AP News, these are all credible news organizations generally, even though they have made mistakes time and time again here and there, um, and they all warrant different degrees of criticizing um, that, yeah, uh, sure, uh, they have made mistakes, but at the same time, uh, the news that they report are much definitely much better than Project Veritas. Um, so uh, at some point, they will begin to have a check and balances to hold each other accountable. Um, eventually, some 
fake news organizations will begin to have their credibility become dumbed down. Um, and in the marketplace of ideas, things begin to get a reputation for what is considered better credibility and lower credibility. The same thing with content creators in this space. We know exactly what which content creators in this space have higher credibility when they speak up about a controversial issue and which content creators have lower credibility when they speak up about a certain issue, right? For example, um, when if Tom Foolery Show reports on something in a serious manner, not just in a joking meme manner like he did, right? Um, like in a serious manner, we can probably assume that it probably has more credibility, not the most credibility, right? We don't really measure it as like it on itself, but we can say that compared to others, compared to others, it probably has more credibility than Zerka, right? If Zerka reported on the news, we would laugh it off because it's fucking Zerka, right? However, does Tom Foley show have more credibility than Zerka? Yes, he does, right? Um, generally, the truth will win out. Um, however, can you find like one outlier where Zerka reports more uh, more credible news than Tom Foley show on one circumstance? Maybe, maybe in the future, maybe in the past, you can find one circumstance where that actually wins out. Yes, but that's an outlier. We want to find one on average. We want to find that to be the case on average, but that doesn't mean overall, over time, across the end of time stretching out into the infinite as the graph as the line approaches infinity right like this is this is what we have to measure anyway that's about it this is like yeah it's this perception this perception about like the marketplace of ideas not working or whatever the heck is wrong it's just wrong um it, the thing is is that it's it it doesn't work when it comes to, uh, it doesn't work when it comes to specific examples and specific instances and specific times where it can be explained away by the culture or the technology or, um, or certain things, right? Or a, a, a feverish rush in order to pump out views, clicks, or materials. However, over time, people value credibility and people generally value the truth. What feels bad are lies. What feels bad is when you are intentionally spreading lies. Generally, people like spreading the truth. And if you are intentionally spreading lies, you don't like doing that. And as long as that bad feeling is there, people will absolutely um, gravitate more towards the truth. And that's about it. Hey Foods, would you be willing to set up a debate with Rob Nor about Jan Jan Six and BLM? I don't know enough about Jan Six to debate Rob Nor at all. Like I would lose hard, and BLM, yes, uh, with Rob Nor hard. Like I just don't feel prepared for something like that. Uh, I'll say the more nuanced take is people always have different levels of credibility with different things. You should be aware of biases, incentives, and punishment or line truthfulness. The, well, yeah, I, I feel like that's sort of included into my thing as well. Yeah, it's just like. Yeah, because the clicks and trying to farm views and stuff like that is like part of that bias, right? Like that is the bias that you have to be cognizant of and you have to be aware of as well. Cherry picking examples where it has failed doesn't mean it wins out over time, especially over time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's the TLDR for sure. Not just Harvard and Yale, but in fact, all major American universities in the Western world offer exactly the same intellectual product. Which institution is more to the left, for example, Harvard or Yale? <sighs> you can pick any two mainstream universities and you will not be able to answer this question. While there is certainly some variation between universities, such as that between Harvard and Berkeley, which displays- Also, also I don't mean to be soy, but this is one of the times where being soy actually wins. I'm sorry, but the, but the truth wins, okay? The truth wins. I, I like it when the truth wins, all right? Like, th there's something soy about it, but I like being soy about it, you know? Like, it's good. It's good to be soy about the truth winning and, and love, love and truth winning, you know? But yeah, that's just me. The sort of provincial excess, the differences. I really wish Alex Jones wasn't there and Rob replaced them. Yeah, true, I, I agree. ...are negligible compared to the differences between Harvard of 2008 and Harvard of 1908 or 1808, etc. It is sort of an intellectual peloton. 
and it is not that we don't see drift. There is plenty of drift. If you ask which is more to the left, Harvard today or Harvard in 1958, the answer is easy. Yet somehow, the entire peloton is drifting in the same direction at the same speed. Does this scream type 3 to you? And yet, if there is some Goebbels telling Harvard and Yale professors what to profess, the secret is awfully well kept. The same is true of newspapers. The so-called mainstream media is certainly a synopsis. Just as there is a bright line between mainstream and non-mainstream universities, there is a bright line between mainstream and non-mainstream media. The latter may be all over the map. The former constitutes a synopsis. And the journalistic and academic synopses are clearly identical. Mainstream journalists do not, as a rule, challenge mainstream academic authority. These quote-unquote mainstream institutions look very, very much like the set of information organs that we would expect to see in a type 1 society, and their product is clearly a synopsis, yet they are clearly not subject to any kind of central coordination. I think the post-1945 mainstream synopsis is important enough to be a proper noun. Let's call it the synopsis. Let us also give the set of institutions that produce and propagate the synopsis, mainstream academia, journalism, and education, the entertainment industry arguably belongs on this list as well, a name. Let us call them the cathedral. This terminology is not meant to disparage real cathedrals, which of course even non-religious reactionaries adore. The main rhetorical point is that those who promulgate the synopsis are, despite their avowed secularism, a faux egalitarianism, in effect, a theocratic priestly class. What? Hey, he just said the word, guys. He just said the cathedral. Ah, oh. yay! What explains these phenomena? The synopsis, of course, has an answer. The answer is that we live in a type three society, and the synopsis is the set of all reasonable ideas. As for the cathedral, it is simply the culmination of the great human quest for knowledge. It is just as permanent as the reality it exists within and elucidates, which is why there will still be a Harvard and Yale in 2108, 2208, and 3008. Here again is our null hypothesis. If you believe in the synopsis and trust the cathedral, you are either a progressive or an idiot. There is no way to receive a mainstream university education, read the Times every morning, trust both of them, and not be a progressive. Unless, of course, you are an idiot. But there is another hypothesis, which is that we live in a Type 2 society. The Type 2 society is the consensus society. Its hallmark is the phenomena of spontaneous coordination. You might call it Gleichschalten without Goebbels. Spontaneous coordination can produce an official information system, which in all other respects resembles that of a type 1 society, but which is not responsible to any central authority or institution. Basically, a type 1 society is a government in which the state controls the press and the universities. A type 2 society is one in which the press and the universities control the state. It is easy to tell the two forms apart, but the customer experience is pretty much the same. Like a type 1 society, a type 2 society can be reasonably comfortable and pleasant to live in, and type 2 design is more stable in some ways and less stable in others. It is not the end of the world. As one would prefer a type 3 society, however, I consider it pernicious. Type 2 societies tend to form from the breakdown of central authority in Type 1 societies. Recall that in a Type 1 society, public opinion is power. It is the power of the mob. A mob cannot defeat an army, but if the army is neutral, whoever has the biggest mob wins. What happens in a Type 1 society when the center fails? When censorship no longer operates, journalists no longer take orders, heretics are no longer burned at the stake, Professors are no longer hired or fired for their political beliefs. You might think that the natural outcome would be a Type 3 society, a marketplace of ideas in which only freedom rules and thoughts compete on their value alone. But the connection between public opinion and political power still holds. Therefore, the information organs are still acting as power centers. What type is Warhammer 40k foods? Uh, if you're talking about like the God Emperor and stuff like that, it sounds like just type one, right? 
If their views diverge, as without type 1 supervision they will, they can compete in two ways, on the basis of intellectual righteousness or on the basis of political power. If they choose the former and abjure the latter, they will be at a disadvantage against those to whom all weapons are friends. Moreover, since political power is a deadlier weapon, successful competitors are likely to resolve any trade-offs between power and righteousness in favor of the former. We can describe the type 1 pathology as coercive power distortion. Political power distorts the... How about the Star Trek universe? Definitely type 3, I would say. Yeah, type 3. ...landscape of ideas, rendering the playing field non-flat. Ideas that the state favors are artificially popularized. Ideas that it disfavors are artificially discouraged. The type 2 equivalent is attractive power distortion. The coercive state does not exist, or at least does not coerce. But the connection between power and public opinion remains. Ideas, therefore, are selectively favored on the basis of their capacity to serve as standards around which to organize coalitions, which can struggle for power by whatever means are effective. Again, from the type 3 perspective, attractive power distortion is pathological for the same reason as coercive power distortion. It is an alternative criterion which contributes to the success or failure of ideas and has nothing to do with their validity. For example, in many ways nonsense is a more effective organizational tool than the truth. Anyone can believe in the truth. To believe in nonsense is an unforgeable demonstration of loyalty. It serves as a political uniform, and if you have a uniform, you have an army. We saw this effect earlier in the cohesive type 1 state, but it works just as well for the competing type 2 factions. This does not explain, however, how the chaotic post-type 1 society congeals into the mature, spontaneously coordinated type 2 society. Why do we have one synopsis and one cathedral, rather than a whole host of competing synopses and cathedrals? The answer, I think, is that even the- Hold on. To be fair, if you're defining the cathedral like that, uh, you're, I'm pretty sure, um, there's two cathedrals, right? The There's the left cathedral and there's the right cathedral. Um, I think Dave, I, I think Dave Green um, and I uh, both agree that there's a left and right cathedral, but Sadly, a student came in for surprise tutoring, so I have been and will continue to be absent for another hour. I hope everyone is enjoying the mold box. Okay, see you, Castile. Thank you for checking in. Yeah, uh, I'm glad that you've been listening in. Yeah. Take care. Type 2 society has only one government. It is impossible for two competing information systems to capture a single government. And capturing a government gives an information system a considerable advantage over any competitors. It can subsidize itself. It can penalize its competitors. It can indulge in the entire sordid range of type 1 pathologies. Without acquiring a central coordinator, the cathedral can capture the resources and powers of the state. It can devise theories of government which it can incorporate into the synopsis, and which the state must follow. These theories naturally involve lavish support of the cathedral, which becomes responsible for the production of public policy, i.e. government decisions, i.e. real power is held by the professors and journalists, i.e. the cathedral. Not through their purity and righteousness, but through their self-sustaining control of public opinion. Lenin's great question, who, whom, i.e. who rules whom, see chapter 7, is answered. But why does the cathedral not break into factions? What keeps Harvard aligned with Yale? Again, my, my take is that we actually live in a type three society, um, not a type two. Uh, are you listening through all the unqualified reservations uh, just now catching up with your distant right streams? Yes, I am. I am. Yes, this is my big project, okay? My big project is liberal consuming far right philosophy, okay? This is my big, big project, all right? And while I am doing that, okay? While I am doing that, um, when was the last time you ever seen a liberal transgender person uh, consume far-right philosophy um, on stream, on air? Uh, live. Yeah.
Um, sorry, I want to clarify in Western society, Western current liberal Western de democracy. Yeah. As far as I know, this has never been done. Oh, true. Never been done. I'm the first one to do it. I'm the first one to do it. It's a hot look. It's not going to lie. I mean, I have the attire for it. Like, look, I have the, um, I have the clothing for it. Um, <clears throat> even the clothing I'm, I have is like, uh, you know, dark enlightenment, right? Look, I'm wearing a dress. <laughs> I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a dress, see? <laughs> See, I'm uh this is this is uh you know tradition brought to modernity. Alright. It's it's both trad and it's modern at the same time. See? <clears throat> Where's the Hugo Boss attire? I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Um, let me see. Let me think. So the reason why I think we live in a type three is because I, I, I feel like I have to think that the professors are like debating with each other and like actually academically rigorous and like cross checking and fact checking each other, right? Like if they're coming out with studies and <clears throat> because I know the, I would have to assume that the uh, academic communities are like constantly trying to nitpick each other's papers apart from what I know, right? Like they're constantly trying to nitpick and cross check each other's papers. Um, academic rigor is Jover. The replication crisis is a sign of this. Yeah, because I can think of also some kind of, because um, I can also think of some kind of like um, examples where people also take. People take some takes and then also sort of reinforce some ideas like, oh, this is, you're, you're valid, this is valid, or this is valid, and this is valid, and this is valid, right? Um, but at the same time, at the same time, I feel like we're generally also like moving towards the truth, right? Like, for example, like, for example, um, I think that there was a greater push towards, um, What was it? I'm trying to think of an example. Because, <clears throat> because there, because typically, whenever a cringe idea is proposed, a, a cringe idea will gain some steam for several years. But then, once some papers come out, uh, after a few years, and the trend is over, um, they get torn to bits. Uh, for a few uh, for a few years afterwards or something mm. and then people move on to the next trend you feel like we're moving towards the truth but how I feel like we've been rapidly moving away from the real truth for like a century oh, like what does that mean yeah but that doesn't stick what does that mean Andrew <laughs> Andrew what does that mean I don't know what does that mean. Like that tells me nothing though. Like I don't know what that means. Like what do you mean by that? <laughs> like yeah, that that doesn't really indicate of anything. Like I don't know what that means. Why doesn't one of the two realize that there is no need for a thousand synoptic progressive universities and a vast un? Melanie, the reason I'm not answering you is because you're half of the time you're trolling me, like in chat. Um, Roman, this is valid. 
left-wing cadence, low IQ statement, and a trend towards lazy argumentative examples to validate nonsense. Um, <clears throat> Nobody really says that in high academic circles. Like, I think it's mainly as a way for people to perform their work in places where they feel like, okay, we can move towards the truth in a space where we feel fine, right? But... Validity can come in different forms, and I think that being valid in how you feel is fine. Um, <clears throat> the more science tries to disprove things, the more people want to steer away from the truth. I don't know. Donnie, Dewitt, welcome to chat. An idea can be politically adaptive, but Darwinistically unadaptive. Promising a room full of children unlimited candy will make you love them, but long wit long term it's dysgenic and will rot their health. Um politically adaptive. I think I think with some ideas you can you can validate their possible correctness temporarily and then later on you can go on to prove or disprove them like present a hypothesis and then see if you can prove or disprove it but then I will admit that in some circumstances we have gone too far um I oh my god actually fuck it yes I remember now, especially with some of the stuff with like hormone treatment for children. Um, I think that, yeah, yeah, like hormone treatment for children. Um, I think this is like, um, I think that there are some really mixed stuff for stuff like that. Um, that is when, um, <clears throat> HRT, children HRT, yeah. Impact of early medical treatment for transgender youth. Yeah, let me see. It's one of these things where it's like, okay, like, do we, can we, can we possibly, like, assume that this can be correct earlier a little bit and then later on try to see if this is correct or incorrect? Because we assume that there is some kind of validity earlier on, I guess. Hold on, let me see. Um. Uh, a study used a longitudinal observational design to examine the outcomes of existing medical uh, treatment protocols for gender dysphoria in two distinct cohorts. Youth initiating puberty suppression and youth pursuing a uh, phenotypic uh, gender transition. Data on routine uh, results. Uh, enrollment was completed and 301 participants were enrolled. Oh, conclusions. Um, although with limited, this researcher's direct response results. I'm making ultimately determine if uh, background. Okay. Abstract. Impact of early. Okay. Dutch model, the network study design. No, oh, no, 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 Roman, Roman, there are mixed results, right? Because because generally it should be fine. Generally it should be fine. Um, but the thing is, is that it's not fine in every single circumstance, right? 
it's not flying in every single circumstance from what I remember, from what I remember, from what I remember. Um, yeah, that's what I remember. It doesn't mean it's flying in every single circumstance, but generally, right? Uh, but that's one of the things that you have to be careful of, right? So cinematic review essentially falls uh, prisma. Uh, da, 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 conclusion evidence in general is, or is insufficient. Yeah, see? Evidence to assess the effects of hormone treatment on the above fields in children with gender dysphoria is insufficient. To improve future research, we present the blah, blah, blah checklist. A checklist for studies in gender dysphoria. Yeah, it's like, you know, um, gender affirming hormone in children and adolescents. Uh, sorry, there's a little bit of a tangent. That's fine. Okay. All right, whatever. Guys, uh, I can't I can't address every single point in chat. We have to at some point we have to move on with the with the actual text. But if you guys if you guys want to ask questions and etc., I'm more than happy to answer questions. Um, but later on, you know, later on, that's fine. Phil demand for a single top notch conservative university. Why, in short, is the synopsis stable? I think the answer is that the synopsis includes only political propositions whose adoption tends to strengthen the cathedral and weaken its enemies. It rejects and opposes all other propositions. Inasmuch as these sets shift over time, the synopsis will shift as well. It follows a sort of hill climbing strategy, not in the landscape of truth, but that of power. Thus, by definition, it cannot be opposed from within. To be progressive is simply to support the cathedral and the synopsis. Today's synopsis is the lineal descendant of the first Type II movement in modern history, the Reformation. Through the Reformation we reach the Enlightenment, whose link to the synopsis is obvious. The post-1945 Western regime, whose victory over all pre-Reformation or anti-Enlightenment forces appears final and irreversible, is the Whig Millennium. I mean millennium only in the sense of utopia. I don't actually expect it to last a thousand years. The terminal condition of our present system of government is that it satisfies the demands for power only by expanding. As it expands, the policy-making process includes more and more input, to the point at which it is completely ineffective. It can thus no longer expand. I don't think analogies to the stellar cycle are at all misplaced. This analysis, which is obviously broad and facile, still explains a few things. For example, let's consider the case of libertarianism. Libertarians often call themselves classical liberals. And indeed, the word libertarian today means about what John Stuart Mill meant when he called himself a liberal. In fact, in Europe today, liberal still means more or less libertarian. Why, in the US, did the term stay the same? and the meaning change. Because, in fact, the real meaning has not changed. In 1858 as in 2008, a liberal is a supporter of the cathedral, i.e. a Whig, a progressive, a radical, etc. It is the synopsis that shifted, and it is today's libertarians who are not with the program. 19th century liberal Whigs and radicals Um. No, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I, I, I don't know if we define terms in the way that they support an institution specifically. We define words in the way that we use them utility wise, but I get the point that he's getting at. Um, he is referring to colloquially in so far that it supports a foundation. It supports a W force. It supports the uh, the progressive W force. That's what he's talking about. He's it supports the cathedral. 
is that <clears throat> in the same sense that in the same sense that uh, conceptually, it still is a supporting force of the cathedral. Its meaning has not changed. What what is the cathedral supporter back in the day is still the cathedral supporter of today. So therefore, in a way, the meaning has not changed. The meaning has not changed because in respect to its time period, it is still a liberal. The meaning has not changed because with respect to its time period, the meaning is the same. So I understand I understand what he's saying. I understand his perspective. But the way we use words is that words evolve in meaning over time even if even if the time periods change. Even if the time periods change, the the words definitions have to change even if the window changes so yeah that's that's a weird way to frame it it doesn't mean that it it doesn't mean that the definition automatically changes politically we have to sort of move it manually right it it has to be moved manually Hardcore class will now are looking like Yahtzees here. More extremists that have massive control over media and academia. <clears throat> We're talking about words definitions. Supported economic freedom because economic freedom meant the destruction of Tory privileges, such as the Corn Laws, whose beneficiaries were landed aristocrats which harmed their supporters and benefited their enemies. This position may have been explained on the basis of principle, but if it had not been politically advantageous, spontaneous coordination would have produced other principles. Either Mill would have embraced these other principles, in which case you would still know his name, or he would have been genuinely committed to economic freedom, in which case you wouldn't. By the start of the 20th century, the old British aristocracy was in full flight, only scrapping Words evolve, so no words are manipulated and twisted to fit the purview of the ever dissatisfied leftist secularists that want to create utopia. But I okay, no, this is this is not specifically no, this is not specifically to that. It's this one is specifically to this is a neutral, this is a politically neutral concept that he is trying to explain, not specifically in regards to leftists. Does that make sense? But also I disagree with him. He is talking about like how the definition is this definition and this definition has always stayed the same because in respect to, um, in, in respect that it contributes towards the W force, therefore, the definition has always stayed the same. But I would argue that the definition has changed because the times have changed. So the, so therefore, human beings will naturally change the definition of a word over time because the spelling of the word, even though the spelling of the word stays the same, the definition will shift over time. For, for example, the word incel the definition, the def the way the people use the word incel have changed. People now use the word incel in a different way than people have used the word incel in the past. That doesn't mean that the word incel, even though the word incel still contributes towards the W force, right? It still contributes in a way, probably towards like a political foundation. You can argue from that lenses, but I would still say that the definition of a word and whether we determine whether or not a word's definition changes 
is not determined on whether or not it contributes towards the W force, but whether or not its meaning just simply changes. That's it. You know, that's it. Yeah. But I get where he's getting at. I get where he's getting at, but he doesn't need to make that argument. It's remained of the throne and altar system. And by the standard of a half century earlier, basically everyone Why was a radical. This? There's no more. Therefore, the progressive movement could become socialist and stand for economic centralization and official charity. These aims were not attainable in the era of Mill because the radicals were too weak and the Tories too strong. These tactical changes did not emerge from any secret cabal. Spontaneous coordination is entirely to blame. Libertarianism in the late 20th and early 21st centuries has gained little political traction. Why? 1. It opposes the cathedral, which controls most real power and does not deal kindly with its enemies. 2. By definition, it has no mechanism for using any power it does gain to create jobs for its followers, because it does not believe in the expansion of government. 3. It either appeals to the anti-cathedral townies or conservatives, making itself unfashionable thus unpopular, and thus ineffective as an opposition, or it tries to ingratiate itself with the cathedral, making itself thus ineffective as an opposition. It has nowhere to go. It cannot recreate the world of John Stuart Mill with its target-rich environment of Tory landlordism. Thus we see again Dr. Johnson's hypothesis. All the principles of Whigs, even those which seem austere and noble, are consistent with the objective of seizing power. Moreover, the Whig is concerned with his own power rather than with the state of society. He would much rather rule in hell than serve in heaven, and he will turn any heaven into a hell to get there. And yet, he is quite sincere in all his Whiggery, which makes him all the more dangerous. <laughs> of course, there Why? is also the null hypothesis. Maybe we already do live in an open society, and the synopsis is no more than sweet reason itself. It would certainly be nice. But if Dr. Johnson was right, what is the answer? Having left the loyal society far behind, how can we proceed from the consensus society to the open society? An open letter to... Okay. All right. And that's chapter four. Cool. It's a, it's a, actually a shorter one than... Um, I think this is a shorter one than chapter three. If I, uh, yeah, I think this is, if I look at the bar, yes, it is actually a shorter one than chapter, yeah, it is. <clears throat> I will say though, I will say though, like for example, another, another word, another word um, that I find whose that's definition that's changed is the word retarded. If we think of the word retarded, um, I think that in the past, right? In the past, uh, it's probably used more as a term to actually describe somebody who is mentally insane, right? To describe somebody who is genuinely, um, mentally retarded right in the sense that they are mentally ill like genuinely mentally ill like diagnosed right but now i don't know if there are any psychiatrists or any doctors who actually use the word retarded in the same sense that they use the word retarded in the past same thing with the word idiot right in the past they probably use the word idiot um in the same sense right Sure, people use the word idiot as an insult in the past, and I'm sure the word retarded in the past as well. But now, do people use the word idiot now as an actual diagnosis term? No, I don't think so. Retarded still used mechanically in medicine? Okay. But they don't, but they don't use originally meant to hinder and make so. Okay. But what about idiot? I really doubt idiot, right? Well, the point is, is that they probably use terms that they've used in the past, but are, but are now just casual insults now, a lot more, right? But we wouldn't say like, oh yeah, these are contributing towards, you know, they, it's, we, we, we won't say something along the lines of like, oh yeah, they are still the same meaning. 
right? Because they contribute towards the same foundations or the same political force. Like, n I don't see that. Like, there are some of these that are politically neutral, right? Like, the word idiot being phrased out is politically neutral. That's not anything that's left or right. So how can you how can you make that argument, right? Or fuck it, even the N-word. It's like, yeah, even slurs, even the N-word, right? 